All right, so let's start today by just doing a little bit more practice with redox and with identifying oxidation and reduction in chemical reactions. And then we'll kind of transition to talking about solution concentrations and doing some chemical reactions and solutions, which is the last bit of chapter eight there. So we start here with this reaction between hydrazine and dinitrogen tetroxide. This is the very reaction that takes place in outer space to propel the rockets when they're in space. Um, so what's going on here? We've got hydrazine reacting with dinitrogen tetroxide to make nitrogen and water vapor. What we want to do is we want to identify what's being oxidized and reduced and also identify the oxidizing and reducing agents. So the first thing that we need to do in order to identify oxidation and reduction is we need to assign oxidation numbers. By assigning oxidation numbers to every single element on that equation, we can get an idea of where we're starting and where we're ending and seeing if there are any changes in the number along the way. So we start with the hydrazine, N2H4. Now, if we follow kind of our first guideline, we can set up an equation, two nitrogens plus four hydrogens is equal to the total charge on the hydrazine, which is zero. Now, the second guideline that's of use to us is the fact that when hydrogen is bonded to a non-metal, we know that the hydrogen is going to be a positive one. So I've got four positive ones and two nitrogens to make up this zero. If I follow the algebra the rest of the way through, this four positive needs to be subtracted. So it becomes four negative on the other side. That means that each nitrogen here must be negative two to go along with the positive one of the hydrogen there. Remember, when we're assigning oxidation numbers, they are being assigned on a per atom basis. So the total charge was positive four for hydrogen and negative four for nitrogen, but each atom carried a fraction of that total charge, depending upon how many there were. So four positive charge divided by four meant that it was a one positive on each hydrogen. Four negative charge divided by two meant that it was a two negative charge on the nitrogen. That's the process that we have to kind of keep in mind. So now we look at the dinitrogen tetroxide, N2O4. It's the same kind of problem. Two nitrogens plus four oxygens this time give us a total charge of zero because again, this is not an ion, this is an uncharged molecule. The rule of thumb that we're going to use here, though, is that we know that each oxygen is negative two. So if I follow the algebra all the way through, I get that two nitrogens are going to be equal to a total of positive eight. That means that each of these nitrogens is positive four. And each of the oxygens is negative two. <clears throat> so again, the total negative charge was negative eight. But if I divide that by the four oxygens, that gives me a negative two charge each. And the total charge on the nitrogen was positive eight. But if I divide that by the two nitrogens in the compound, that gives me positive four each. 
Now, luckily, the product side of this reaction is considerably easier. I have nitrogen by itself, uncharged, elemental. It's got no charge. All of the oxidation states for all of those nitrogens there, all six of them, are zero. And the six coming from, I've got two, two nitrogens per molecule and I've got three molecules. So six nitrogens in total. And for the water, we can follow our guidelines again. Oxygen is usually negative two. Hydrogen is usually positive one when it's bonded to a non-metal. And so there it sits. So now we've assigned oxidation numbers for everything. What we want to look for are changes. So I can look here and see, okay, the oxygen was negative two before, it's negative two after. There's no change for the oxygen. The hydrogen, positive one before, positive one after, no change in the hydrogen. Now, if we went through the whole thing and found no changes anywhere, what that would indicate is that the reaction is not a redox reaction. It's just, a, it's another type instead. But we can see here with the nitrogen, we've got two changes going on. We've got a change from negative two to zero for the nitrogen in hydrazine. And we have a change from positive four to zero for the nitrogen in the dinitrogen tetroxide. And so the question that gets asked here, and um, we saw some of it in the, uh, if you haven't done assignment 8.3 yet, you're gonna see this kind of thing again, only in reverse. The question is, can the same element be oxidized and reduced? And the answer is yes, if one of two things are happening, either the things that are being oxidized and reduced are coming from different sources. So they, the component of hydrazine and the component of nitrogen, uh, dinitrogen tetroxide are being oxidized and being reduced. They just happen to be the same element in both molecules. It's a weird coincidence, but it's possible. And we're showing it's possible there. Or Let's say that we were doing the reverse of this reaction and the nitrogen was turning into those two molecules there. Well, in that particular case, that would be the opposite occurrence where we have a single source of nitrogen reacting and producing multiple products that have different oxidation states. In both cases, the same element is being oxidized and reduced but there's a difference in sourcing or in production that allows that change to happen. If I don't have one of those two scenarios, it's not possible for it to happen. If I have a single source of nitrogen on the reactant side and a single source of nitrogen on the product side, they're not going to split into different kinds of oxidation states. Remember, all of the oxidation states for an element in a given compound are the same. So that's why we were able to say the nitrogen was always negative two in hydrazine and always positive four in the dinitrogen tetroxide. You can't have multiple oxidation states of an element in the same compound. But if I do have different compounds that happen to have the same elements in them, those different compounds can have different oxidation states. 
So what's going on here? Well, let's take a look at the green reaction. The hydrazine, nitrogen is going from a negative two state to a zero state. How would I describe that in terms of electrons? Are electrons going into the hydrazine or are they going out of the hydrazine? Which process is this? Well, maybe a better way to ask this question is this. What charge does an electron have? Negative. So if I was adding electrons, I would expect that the charge would get more negative, right? Is that what's happening here? No, it's getting less negative, which means the electrons aren't coming in they're going out and the loss of electrons is oxidation, Leo. So this is an oxidation process. And we would say that the nitrogen in hydrazine specifically is being oxidized that's the element whose oxidation state is changing. And by contrast, the positive four state turning into zero, I can now see positive four going to zero. That's getting more negative. It's getting less positive. That's the influx. That's electrons coming into the nitrogen here. Gain of electrons is reduction, GER. And specifically, we would talk about the nitrogen in the dinitrogen tetroxide as being the thing that is reduced. So in this process, the green reaction, that's our oxidation. The purple reaction, that's our reduction. As we've said before, both processes have to occur simultaneously. The nitrogen is leaving the hydrazine and going to the dinitrogen tetroxide. Now, how do I identify the last two terms? The oxidizing agent and the reducing agent. I briefly mentioned this on Wednesday. It needs saying again though. The oxidizing agent is the reactant that forces oxidation. So which reactant forced oxidation? You've got two options. No, hydrogen is not an option. Oh, hydrazine. It's not the hydrazine. So remember, to be a reducing agent or an oxidizing agent, you have to be a reactant, a full on reactant in the balanced chemical equation, not just an element in it, but the full on reactant. Now, which one is the oxidizing agent? It's actually the dinitrogen tetroxide. Why? Because again, it's forcing oxidation. It's not forcing oxidation on itself. It's forcing the other thing to give up its electrons. So our oxidizing agent is going to contain within it the element that gets reduced. 
And that means that the hydrazine in this case is the reducing agent. Again, the reducing agent forces the reduction of something else. It basically forces that nitrogen, take these electrons. I don't want them. So some element inside of the reducing agent gets oxidized in the process. And that's where the confusion can be sometimes because our first instinct is to say, okay, I get the oxidation part. I get the reduction part. Why is it the thing that is oxidized also the oxidizing agent? Because it's not. Oxidizing agent forces oxidation. It doesn't force itself to give up electrons. It forces something else to give up electrons. In turn, takes those electrons away. It gets reduced. All right, questions about this? Mike? So per, per reaction, is there a way to tell which one's the oxidation agent or what reducing agent? So then you would go to the elements themselves. So again, if there's a third reactant here, then that third reactant wouldn't contain something that was oxidized or something that was reduced its oxidation states wouldn't change. And so you just kind of leave it aside. Okay, it's there. It must have some other purpose, but it doesn't actually participate in the redox part of the reaction. Other questions? All right, I've got here a simpler reaction for you. Hydrogen reacting with fluorine to make hydrogen fluoride. What I want you to do is this, go through and assign all the oxidation numbers and then go through the process of identifying what was oxidized, what was reduced, what the oxidizing agent was, what the reducing agent was. So take a few minutes to do this and then we'll kind of talk about it and we'll get into um, kind of wrapping this up and getting into the last bit of calculation. All right, so let's take a closer look at this problem then. So we've got hydrogen reacting with fluorine to make hydrogen fluoride. So right off the bat, we should be recognizing, okay, hydrogen is an element. There is nothing else with it. It's got to be zero. Same with the fluorine. Fluorine is an element. It's got nothing else with it. It's got to be a zero. So if you're coming up with positive one and negative one for the hydrogen and the fluorine as reactants, you're not thinking about this the right way. You know, do the algebra in your head here. This has no charge. So two times hydrogen is equal to zero. There's only one logical answer here for hydrogen then. It has to be zero. Again, hydrogen can't exist in two oxidation states in the same element or in the same compound. So it can't be that one of them is positive one and one of them is negative one and they happen to cancel out. They have to all be the same. So when we've got elements, even molecular elements, they're all gonna be in the zero state. Now for this one, hydrogen and fluorine, well, fluorine is negative one when it's not zero and hydrogen is positive one when it's with non-metals. So both of our guideline rules kind of worked out there. So first four answers should have been zero, zero, positive one, negative one. 
Now I look at how they are changing. The hydrogen went from a zero state to a positive one state. Well, that looks like a loss of an electron to me. We know that loss of electrons is oxidation. So hydrogen was my element oxidized. And for the fluorine, I went from the negative one state to the, or excuse me, backwards. I went from the zero state to the negative one state. That looks like a gain of electron to me. Gain of electrons is reduction. Fluorine was reduced. Now we have to come to the idea of oxidizing and reducing agents. And remember, it's more or less that they are switched. So if you said that F is the oxidizing agent and H is the reducing agent, you're half right. What you're missing, remember it's the full reactant that goes into those agents. So it's not F, it's F2. Fluorine molecule is the oxidizing agent and hydrogen molecule H2 is the reducing agent. So if you're kind of looking out at what a possible quiz question would look like from chapter eight, you're going to see a problem like this on that quiz. Assign your oxidation numbers, figure out where the electrons are going. The place where the majority of you make your mistakes is in that last part right there, where all you do is you just take the oxidizer and the, the oxidized and the reduced elements and you flip them around and you forget that they're part of substances. Remember, it's the full reactant that is the oxidizing agent. It is the full reactant that is the reducing agent, not just the element that changes. All right, any questions before we put redox away? All right, so we have a little bit less than 15 minutes left. Let's talk about some concentration. So when we are dealing with solutions, since solutions are not pure substances, we can't use traditional means to measure them. I can't just weigh out the solution and divide by the molar mass to figure out the number of moles in that solution. It doesn't work that way. A solution is gonna be water mixed with something else. So molar mass doesn't do a whole lot for me there if I'm measuring the whole solution because the whole solution isn't pure. So that's where concentrations come in because concentrations will allow us to see the relationship between the total amount of solution and the part of the solution that we're actually interested in, the part that is doing the reacting, the part that is um, giving us a titration or that we're going to ultimately measure to figure out how much solution we need or how much uh, solution we have. So concentration values come into one of two types. We're either looking at ratios of solute and solvent. We'll get more on that in chapter 11. Or we are going to talk about solute and solution. And that's going to be our primary focus in this chapter. Now, there are a variety of different ways to account for solute and solution. And we're going to talk about two common ones, one that's based on mass and one that is based on moles. So let's start with the one that's based on mass, mass percent. Now, we've already dealt with mass percent when we were talking about composition of compounds. 
the idea that this particular compound is 45% iron and this particular compound is 38% vanadium. We've already touched on this concept for compounds, but now we can talk about it in terms of solutions as well. Formula is exactly the same. Mass percent concerns us with the mass of the substance that we are exploring, which is gonna be our solute. divided by the total mass of the solution. And then we take that ratio, mass of solute divided by total mass and multiply it by 100 to turn that fraction into a percentage. So that's mass percent. And again, this is a familiar one to us. We've seen it already. But what we're going to throw in here now is something that we've seen maybe a little bit of. You did a lab on um, the uh, municipal water samples not that long ago, where the measurements of those municipal water substances were always given in parts per million. Well, now we have an idea of what parts per million are. Parts per million, PPM, are equal to the mass of the solute divided by the total mass multiplied by 10 to the sixth. 10 to the sixth, well, that's a million. That's where the parts per million part comes in. We're taking that ratio and multiplying it by a million instead of multiplying it by a hundred like we did in percent. For even smaller concentrations, we can use parts per billion. Same exact ratio that we saw, but now instead of multiplying by a hundred or multiplying by a million, we're multiplying by 10 to the ninth, which is one billion. <clears throat> so the thing that I want you to kind of draw out of this is that those three concentration values are all calculated the exact same way. It's a mass ratio. Mass of solute divided by total mass. What differentiates percent from parts per million from parts per billion is what we multiply by at the end. Percentage, parts per 100, sometimes called, we multiply by 100 to get that percent. Parts per million, we multiply by a million. Parts per billion, we multiply by 1 billion. So those are our three concentration values that are based in percentages based in masses and masses only. For moles, we're gonna use something called molarity. Now, you've been indirectly exposed to molarity all semester. Anytime you've been given a substance that had a concentration value on it, it was always given to you in molarity. 1.0 capital M sodium hydroxide, 0.25 capital M copper two nitrate. Regardless of what it was, if it had a concentration value on it, that concentration value was almost always molarity. Now molarity is the number of moles of a solute divided by the total volume of that solution. So again, we're focusing on that second kind of ratio relating solute and solution as opposed to solute and solvent. What's nice about molarity is because it uses volume, it's very easy to measure. A graduated cylinder can measure the volume of a solution. 
And if I take that volume of the solution and multiply it by the molarity, that gives me a direct relationship to the number of moles of that substance that are present. Molarity times volume in liters gives me moles. And with those moles, I can convert to grams using molar mass. I can convert to particles using Avogadro's number. We'll get to this on Monday when we come back. I can convert those moles into other moles like we do in stoichiometry if I have a balanced chemical equation. So this relationship of molarity and volume in liters is one of the primary reasons why we use molarity so often. Because again, volume is easy to calculate. It's easy to measure. And if we have the volume measured, we can very easily turn it into moles. And as you know from chapter seven, once we get to moles, everything opens up to us. We can convert it to pretty much anything else. So let's close this out by doing a practice problem here. What is the molarity of an aqueous solution made by adding 36.5 grams of barium chloride to enough water to make 750 milliliters of solution? So since we are doing molarity, we need moles per liter. So that would be moles of barium chloride divided by liters of solution. So the first thing we need to do is we need to figure out the number of moles of barium chloride, 36.5 grams of barium chloride, BACL2. Molar mass of barium chloride, we've got barium, which is 137.33. And we've got chlorine, 35.45 times two, since there are two of them. Total mass, 208.23 grams in every mole. So if I do that conversion, 36.5 divided by 208.23, the three significant figures, we get 0.175 moles of barium chloride. So that covers the top part of our fraction. Now we need to look at the bottom part. 750.0 milliliters of solution There are 1,000 milliliters in every liter. So to four sig figs, 0 0.7500 liters of solution. Now you could have just moved the decimal in your head and got to the same value. Um, if you're comfortable doing that, you don't need to show that particular step um, in the work. find the molarity, I take the ratio of the two, 0.175 moles divided by 0 0.7500 liters. Two, three significant figures, it is 0.234 molar barium chloride. Now, one final note here about this. This is really important. When we report a concentration unit, we need to make sure that three things are there. First of all, we have to make sure it's rounded correctly. It's got the correct number of sig figs. Second, we've got to have the unit on there, capital M for molarity. Reason why? 
There are a bunch of concentration units. We want to make sure that we are reporting the right one. And the third, the barium chloride there. We want to identify what that concentration is and what it is representing. A lot of times we have solutions that have multiple solutes in it. So we want to make sure that we're representing the particular solute that we just did the calculation for. So make sure it's rounded correctly. Make sure it has a unit. Make sure you identify the solute when you do this kind of calculation. All right, on your way out today, give me one more confidence meter before we get into spring break and have a wonderful break. I'll see you when we come back the next Monday. Have a good day.